In this video, we'll be taking a look at my Compact Portable 2. So this is an early portable computer. It's one of the, I think, second or third one that Compact made. So it's a pretty old machine. It's from 1986. And yeah, it's an early portable computer. So as you can see, it's portable because on top it has a handle. And you can sort of, you know, lift it. <laughs> Even though it does weigh 10 kilograms, so it's not really the, mo the nicest thing to carry. Um, the other week I was carrying, I had to carry this on the bus to an event I was showing it at. It's not easy to carry this on the bus. <laughs> and you look a bit silly doing it. So here's the machine, so this is, this is actually the top of it almost when it's in use. So there's the old portable 2 thing there with the handle, it's actually a leather handle, it's quite nice. Um, and then right on the side of the machine you can see we have this flap which comes down, so that slides down and that reveals a power supply where you just put a normal IEC lead in and a main switching rocker switch to switch it on and off. Around the back, um, I'll show you that in a second. And around this side, there's another one of these flaps which slides down and shows off the, the I.O. ports. So here's the I.O. in the system. As you can see, there's four slots. These are regular ISA slots. So yeah, a portable computer with six regular expansion cards. We'll see this when we get inside later. Um, so here we have a parallel port and a serial port. This card also provides a bunch of other stuff we'll see inside. Here's our video card, which is a CGA card. There's a CGA monitor output and a composite video output as well as a sort of, is that a pin? Sort of pin headers in there for something? Don't know what they're for, maybe jumpers. And then there's one other card here that's got a two, that's a two meg RAM card and then one empty slot. So now we'll take a look at how you set this machine up. So what you have here is a little flap, so you can put these two, push these two buttons in and this folds open. And this reveals the power cable. So it's actually got built-in power cable storage located in the bottom there, so you can actually keep your power cable inside the machine and carry it with you. And then this turns into a stand, so you fold it like this, clip it in there, it can clip into there or there, so you've got different positions um, to, to angle it differently. And what you then do is turn it round and put it over like that, so it stands on its stand. And then there's these two switches here which you slide in, and, there's, a button, and there's your keyboard. So there is the Compact Portable 2 open in all its glory. So first of all we have this keyboard, which is a pretty non-standard layout. They've obviously had to do it to make it a bit more compact. So you have weird things, you have the control key where the caps lock key would normally be. Um, you don't have a sort of arrow keys there built into the numpad, so you have to use that. Caps locks down here. It's just a bit of a strange layout. Um, it's a weird keyboard. This thing is also constructed using foam and foil. So under each key there's a little foam sponge type thing. Then on the bottom of that there's a bit of foil, and that makes contact with the PCB underneath. So it's very simple construction, so it's very lightweight. However, it's not the nicest thing to type on ever. Um, in fact, it's pretty horrible. It could do with a bit of a clean. Uh, when I first got it, the full stop key didn't work. Um, so I had to take the keyboard completely apart, which is actually quite easy to do. And then use alcohol to clean the contacts down on the PCB, and that's completely fixed it. I need to give these key caps a bit of a clean, but I'll do that at some point in the future. So now here we are looking at the front of the machine. So we have the 9-inch monochrome CRT. This is a green on black screen. Here we then have a brightness um, knob for it. Um, the hard drive is sort of located behind this, and this is a floppy drive, which pushes in and pops up, revealing the five and a quarter inch floppy drive underneath. This also ejects it, so when you open this flap, the disc comes out. So now look at it turning on. So now we're ready to take a look at this machine running. So we'll turn it on at the side here, and here it'll start up. And you can see that's it sort of putting on the screen counting its RAM. So this machine has two and a half megs of RAM. So that's going to start up there. So you expect this machine, it has two and a half megs of RAM. It has a 480, no, a 286 processor, um, which is clocked at either six or eight megahertz. You can switch it between the two. And a 10 or 20 meg hard drive. I think it's 10 meg. So that's it doing its RAM count there, which is finished. So you can see it's now giving warnings about system options not being set. I'll try and increase the brightness, see if that's more readable on camera. Yeah, that's a bit. So it's saying system options not set. That's because the CMOS battery in this machine is totally dead. So in order to do this, we need to actually insert the setup disk. It doesn't have a built-in BIOS setup utility. So I have that disk here, which I did actually have to create. You can actually find these on the internet. You can download images of these, so it wasn't actually too bad. Um, so we put the disk in and boot off of it. Then press F1. 
and that's now going to boot up from that disk. Now we need to do this because otherwise it won't be able to detect its hard drive and boot from the hard drive. So we can run through the setup utility, that will tell it it's able to now boot, it will find the hard drive and then we can boot into DOS off the hard drive. So, not going to bother setting the date, can't be bothered. Um, set up. So I'm going to set up program. Nice little animation there. Now we just go through this. Just all the faults are usually okay. So you hear the hard drive being detected there. And then if we simply press F3 and say we want to save changes, machine will now reboot. So we can take that disk out and it will boot into DOS off of its hard drive. And there we go, we're now into DOS. So as you can see it's saying Compaq DOS version 3.3, .3, so it's basically MS-DOS 3. Um, and I'm not going to show too much because it is literally just DOS, it's not exciting. Um, but I've also got Windows installed, so we can use Windows 1. There we go, so there's Windows 1. Unfortunately I've not got a working mouse, I've got a serial mouse but it causes the machine to hang, so I'm not sure why. It's possibly a faulty mouse. but. We can still use that a bit with keyboards there's like paint in Windows 1. Also known as this green screen. The, the screen's actually not that sharp compared to say the green screen on my IBM XT. It's not as good but it's usable. Um, and yeah, there's paint on Windows 1. Let's cut out of that. And we'll now shut it down and we'll take a look inside it. So special menu in session. This is something quite, I found quite interesting, yeah, that Windows 1 uses a special menu, much like old versions of Mac OS. Obviously, I think they still, I think they still had that in Windows 2, but Windows 3 they changed it. So, special end session. Okay, and we're back to DOS. So yep, it can run various different DOS things that you can run on 286, but that's not the coolest thing about this machine, so now we'll take a look inside. Let's turn it off on the side, and let's open it up. As I was about to open up that up there, I completely forgot to park the hard drive. Because this machine is of an age where you still have to prepare the hard drive to be moved. Which is particularly important on a portable computer like this. So to do this, I'm going to use a program called Speedstore, which I've got copied the hard drive. So CDSSTOR. And you see it has, we need to go and say we want to park the heads. So we do that and you'll hear the drive will make a little noise and then it will be ready to be moved. So if that came up on camera, there's a little squeak from the hard drive and now it says drive ready to be moved. which is moved. So now the heads have been moved to a predetermined space on the disk, which means it's now safe when the drive is moved that the heads aren't going to hit the disks and damage it. So now we can turn it off here and now we can open it up. So now we're ready to open this machine up. So on each side there's two screws, um, one here and one on the same side with the ISA slots um, that we need to take out. So these are Torx screws, um, they've used Torx throughout this machine, which is a bit of an interesting idea, but it's okay, I've got a screwdriver for it. Um, so we take those two screws there out. You've got to be very careful here because there's this nice useful gap here, so when you inevitably drop a screw it goes right down inside the machine, and it's <laughs> then you have to take it apart to get it out. And that was the same thing, so slide that flat down. Comes off. Oh, that's close. Almost dropped that one. Good. Cool. So now, now what we need to do is just lift the outer shell off. So it just lifts up like this. Around the other side's a wee bit tricky because of a bad design with this. So it slides up. There, like that. But now it has this really bad design where this where this piece hits this IEC connector. So you've got to sort of carefully manoeuvre it out so it gets around that, which is really annoying. There we go, and the top should now be off, almost. There we go. You have to be very careful with this because at this age it's quite brittle plastic, so you don't want to risk cracking it. So that's the top now off. Now what we can see is we have this massive metal casing around it. 
it's absolutely huge. Um, this is probably a lot of it for both structural strength and um, RF shielding. You can see they obviously cut the holes out though for ventilation and probably to save a bit of weight too. So now there's these different areas, so I'll flip the machine over and we'll take a look inside it. So the first thing we'll look at in here is the card cage. So this is held in with a bunch of screws all located around it. You just, you just need to loosen these off because they're all slotted. The only one you need to remove is one screw located on the side here. The panel then slides sideways and lifts off. Like that. And that reveals... Uh, this is actually quite light metal. I don't know what it is, um, but it's actually surprisingly light when you get it off. Now what we have, as we can see here, we have these expansion cards which are pretty massive. So the first card we'll take a look at here, I may as well take it out just to show it because it is a thing of beauty, is the RAM expansion card, which is located here. So I'll get this out of the machine and show it in a sec. So here's the first card of this machine, and this is just absolutely amazing. This is the 2 megabyte RAM expansion card. For comparison, that is a modern stick of RAM. I think this is about 2 gig, I don't even know, but it's a DDR2 stick of RAM. That is a size comparison. <laughs> so it just shows the evolution between, like, in technology, like two gigs, or I mean, these go up to like 16 gigs now in this size versus two, two meg. So it's mental. So here's the machine, it's actually a 16 bit ISA card, so it goes into the regular ISA bus. Over here, we have a bunch of discrete, um, all through whole components on here. Um, must be controlling the card and stuff. And then here is just the bank of RAM chips. There's absolutely, there's 72 of these chips. So there's 72 different RAM chips in this machine. They're, it's absolutely amazing. Just banks and banks of stick of chips here. And you can see it's so old, the chips are actually still say West Germany on them. So yeah, this is a really nice card. So you see down there it's labelled the Parity RAM card. Um and yeah, that's it there. There's also some even some dip switches to configure it here. That I'm not gonna risk touching because I've got no idea what they do, and I'll never get them back in the right position again. And that's the back, just loads and loads of solder joints for all those ancient through hole components. So it's a, almost dropped it there. But yeah, that is the two megabyte ISA RAM expansion card this machine has. It has 640K on board as well, so that's why we have the, you know, the two meg plus the 640K on board. Next up, we have the graphics adapter in this machine. So here it is, yet another absolutely massive card. Like, to put it in perspective, this is way longer than like a modern video card. Like my GTX 770 is tiny in comparison to this, so, like, it just shows the sheer evolution here. So this is an 8-bit card, as we can see here, and it's labelled the VDA, VDU controller. It's a nice old terminology there. Again, it's all really old through-hole components. I'll move it slowly and see if you can get part numbers off things. There's an old compact custom chip there. That's probably some sort of ROM, given it's in a removable socket. Loads of sort of 74 series chips. It's just really old. There you go, it's copyright 1985 up there. Which is older than this machine, but they probably use this card in other systems as well. And in the back we can see the ports that we saw from the outside. What this card also has on it that makes it a bit different to like a normal ISA CGA card is this connector here. This is what connects the internal monitor. So there's inside the machine there's this cable that snakes out from the monitor bay. That there connects onto this, and that connects up the internal monitor to the card. The final card we have in this machine is this much shorter 16-bit card that provides all the I.O. that this machine has. So as we can see here, it has both a floppy drive port and a hard drive connection, which is labelled Winch for, maybe for an old Winchester hard drive. Um, and then on the side here, we have the serial and parallel ports. So this is a much smaller card. Again, there's more dip switches here to configure things. Um, and there's a bunch of old bunch of chips that are on it. And then we can see around the back here, um, it's labelled up here. It, again, copyright 1985 compact. And there it lists everything it has, so floppy, printer, serial, and Winchester. It's also got a diagram number, which must have been so, if you're a service technician, you could find the schematic for this. This connects the hard drives, using uh, hard drive and floppy drive using these cables here, and that cable goes to the LED on the front of the hard drive. With those cards removed, we can now see a bit more of the motherboard. The motherboard itself is actually buried under the entire machine, so it's not really easy to get out. But here we can see the slots, so we've got a pair of 16-bit ISA slots, and a pair of 8-bit ISA slots, as well as a bunch of other components over here, a sort of unused socket. It's quite hard to find information on this though, so I don't really know what that socket there is for, for example. What we can now do is we can look over here. So we have the hard drive. So the hard drive is located under this metal panel here, 
Um, it was held with eight screws for some reason, which is a complete pain to take off. So I've taken them out already, and that just lifts off. So here we have the hard drive. So this is a three and a half inch full height unit. It's made by Miniscribe, as you can see here. And as you can see here, it was made on the 17th of February, 1986. On the top here, we have the defect list, which has none written on it, so there mustn't be any defects, or at least when it was new, um, as well as various handwritten sort of quality check marks. Down here we can see the interface, which is a three, which is a regular four-pin Molex, and then a, a sort of ribbon cable to the controller card. The other interesting thing with this hard drive is it's actually shock-mounted because this is obviously a portable machine, and they want it to be fairly vibration shock-mounted. So these are actually quite nice rubber brackets, and then the hard drive can actually sort of move on that. So that provides a bit of sort of shock mounting for the hard drive. And then down below the hard drive we have the floppy drive. It's not going to take it out, but it's a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Again, four pin Molex to power it. And here's the ribbon cable. The ribbon cable also has a second connector on it here. So you could obviously have a second floppy drive instead of a hard drive in this machine. And that just goes up to the controller card. So now we have this metal panel that has a CRT under it, and as well as the power supply. So obviously there's a lot of safety warnings. I could take it off, but there's also a lot of screws that I'm going to lose and it's, it would just take too long to get off. Um, but under here you have the CRT and power supply, along with the cooling fan for the power supply. So as you can see here, there's a bunch of safety warnings, and then these labels here, which are actually for potentiometers, located through these holes. So you can stick a screwdriver through these holes and adjust things such as the width, the focus, the master height, the master video center. I'd probably need an instruction manual to know what these do. I mean, it could be worth playing with to adjust the screen if it's not very good, so they're located there. And it's quite clever how they've done it with the holes, so you don't have to take all the panels off and open up the hazardous area just to adjust the screen. So what we'll now do is we'll try and put it back together again. Hopefully, hopefully i get it back together. So there you go. That was a look at my Compact Portable 2. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment, rate and subscribe. You can also visit my website at cameragray.me and follow me on Twitter at cameragray1515. Thanks for watching.